all called the forgotten man. Is that what they're saying? Or did you ever? What a swell part of this is. And have you heard the story of a boy, a girl, unrequited love? Sounds like pure soap opera. I may cry. <laughs> what a swell well, good evening, Swankers. It's Suzanne Donisthorpe here. I'm um, here with Frank Belt, and we're our, doing our inaugural Art Swank program. Hi, Frank. How are you going? Hello. Hello, we're on, we're on the wonderful Main FM, and it's a swell, elegant, elegant party we have planned for you tonight. Swell, elegant. Yes, tonight, Swell, elegant Art Swank will be uh, featuring the marvellous Shirley Saul, who may not be a local castle maniac, but I reckon she's someone who would fit right in here. Um, I actually first met her 20 years ago, and I recently caught up with her in rural Portugal, where she and her partner John run this amazing place that they call um, Slacadonia, which is an agrarian workers' socialist utopia, I think. And actually it's an amazing 250-year-old house in the middle of um, rural Portugal, Surrounded by um, people would, in Castlemaine would recognise as very bad forest because it's eucalypt everywhere, isn't it? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, one kind and in very neat rows. Very neat rows because it's all plantations. So there is a kind of weird Australian element to rural Portugal. And in fact, a lot of Europe is the same. And like Castlemaine and like rural Victoria or actually Australia, it's also prone to bushfires. And that very thing happened in July this year to Shirley. And her beautiful garden that she'd been working on for many years was sacrificed by the fire. And she looks out now and um, sees what she thinks is a bit like a Fred Williams painting with all the blackened earth and then the, the regrowth, frilly kind of turquoise regrowth uh, coming up on the, um, on the bases of the blackened gums. She's an amazing woman. She was a new media artist pioneer back in the day b before the internet became much of a thing, in fact, when it was very much in its infancy. And I met her actually smoking on the balcony of the ABC, as you do when everyone, who that's how we met everybody at the ABC in those days. That doesn't happen anymore, of course. But um, she's making her own world. And I thought she'd be a good person to start the uh, Art Smoke show for 2016 to talk about what it's like to live out in rural Portugal and try and make a kind of art paradise. Let's hear from Shirley. referring to us as techno peasants so it's not really a traditional way of living it's more a, a case of taking the huge advantages of the present which which are particularly the free sharing of information through digital technologies and the ability to be in contact with people all over the world who know stuff and who can tell you stuff and help you out and who in, in return you can often you know reciprocate with something but putting it into as a low impact lifestyle where we are trying to regenerate the land which has been fairly uh, ignored for the last 40 years um, and not really cultivated. And we're also trying since the fire to try and fireproof the land a bit. I love this term techno peasant. I mean, I think that's a great <laughs> way of describing it because in your art practice, you were very involved with internet at the, uh, as I, I remember meeting you a long time ago and you just joined the ABC and you were working online there in, in a time before we really understood exactly what that meant but you were a really early adopter for that so you and the internet are very closely um, associated and in fact your practice was part of it so tell us about your practice. I trained as a normal perfectly ordinary artist in the 80s. That is, I was trained to make large-scale installations that were completely impractical on any kind of collection, sale, selling, or any other level. But also at a time when the whole 
international art star economy was really being built and really booming. So the art fairs got a lot, a lot of the art fairs started in the late eighties, early nineties, and so forth. So I was inserting myself into a uh, an economy which was already moving past non-commercial practices and was very much, um, it, it was becoming, and perhaps the art world always has been this way, but it was it was very dog-eat-dog. Dog. And never enough dog to go around. And never enough dog to go around. Yeah. yeah. It was chihuahua-eat-chihuahua, chihuahua, really. <laughs> <laughs> and... I hated who I became in the conventional art world, the kind of competitive, mean-spirited approach to other people. Because you're in direct competition with people, Mm. very difficult to keep being open-minded and open-hearted about Mm. other people's practices. So do you think that's why, I mean, the art world is bitchy. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Do you think that that not enough dog to go around scenario is at the heart of that? Is that why people can't form communities as easily as they possibly would like to? I think there's a bunch of reasons and I think that the history of of modernist art is is a history of building art into an exclusive object produced in cottage industry scenarios to sell to very wealthy people. Many years ago, and this was really perhaps the t- the crossing point for me, uh, the, the then director of Gertrude Street, I was on the Gertrude Street uh, committee and I was a Gertrude Street studio artist. And the then uh, director of Gertrude Street, after we'd had a long fight in a meeting about who should be exhibiting, and I was protesting that they were having too many well-known people, and not being inclusive enough, turned around and said, surely, you really have to just grow up and stop being so naive. 90% of art has to be deemed crap for the 10% to be deemed good. Mm. And we are in the job of deciding who that 10% is. Mm. Mm. That's quite depressing, isn't it? It was really depressing. Mm. At that time, though, computers and personal, and, and particularly personal computers were really just starting to be available. And I remember once somebody saying, oh, I just did a computer course. I was like, oh, computers, they sound interesting, but I'm sure I'll never have to use one, so I won't have to bother about that. Two years later, uh, my collaborator and I, James Harley, and I used to work on a project called an installation publication, which was an exhibition in a paper bag. And we ran it as in editions, but we had the idea of rather than an exhibition in a paper bag, it would be an exhibition in a computer. Ooh, that was like, yeah. woo! This yeah. is, I think about uh, 89 or so. So we bought an Amiga and it was like, love at first bite. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it really was a time before computers had become so ubiquitous and the internet was barely functional, wasn't it? Well, there wasn't an internet. Well, there, there was an internet insofar as there were things like Gopher. Do you remember Gopher? I remember and two cows. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there they are over there. <laughs> Before Google, everybody, there was this yeah. thing called two cows, which oh, God knows what happened to them, but they're certainly not out there anymore. But it, I remember, well, at the ABC at that time, because I was working there, we didn't have email. No. And, and we, you know, we didn't have, we had a I had a typewriter. I was lucky enough to be machine. given a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, no computers at all. No. And how the world has changed. But then, of course, that, that also works in the art world, and that's where your practice really changed, wasn't it? It was. When we, when we got that computer and did a, we did a national tour around Australia with um, an installation publication, Fact, which I think was issue 10 of our project, and... People were really, we we had to get a program written to run a slideshow on a screen wow. and then let people, and have the ability for people to print out a particular image at any time that they wanted that image. Mm. Like, you know, it, it took us six months and, and quite a bit of our own money to get, yeah. a, you know, something now that you, any piece of software can right. easily do. You can do it on your phone, on Facebook, yeah. in, a, in a remote um well, in fact, a remote Portuguese village, which I did not so long ago. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. But it also put us in touch with people who were f- just beginning to work in those technologies. 
and who are being completely ignored by the conventional art world or excoriated by them often, mm. uh, which I have to say continues to this day. Look at the way that filmmakers hate digital. They just, mm. it's like it's a personal front. Yeah, and yet they should be allies. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Exactly. But the digital media world, the art, the digital art world, was, was, it was a lovely place because nobody, there was no money there. There was no... Ego. E- there were very few egos. People helped each other out. It was a con- constant learning curve because of the upgrading of equipment. It was lovely. And I thought, these are people I want to help out. And mm. being a, a, an artist myself, I thought, I will do more good creatively assisting other people's projects than trying to be an art star myself. Mm. And so, but you were, you became a bit of an art star. I mean, the, you are being a little bit modest here. I mean, your reputation is quite um, formidable on the internet. People have told me this. <laughs> <laughs> I pay them to tell you that. Um, but thank you, thank you. I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't even think about it anymore mm. because but, I make stuff now mostly under a pseudonym and mostly for my own entertainment and not to insert into an art world, world mm. because there's no place for it. Mm. Having said that, though, I mean, that is, as a techno peasant, you can bring that amazing capacity to do high-end, big city, um, first world art in a place as gorgeous and remote and kind of ancient as, as where we are today. Absolutely. To be perfectly honest, though... Um, to do any l- major data transfers, I have to go into town and use their internet space. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they do have a free internet space in the middle of, you know, basically nowhere. Mm. But you is... could do a lot of stuff online and then post yeah. it. Later. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is an interesting idea that you can have this sort of world community and be quite remote at the same time. And that must. Absolutely. I mean, and, and what you bring to your art practice is obviously influenced by where you are too. Absolutely. I think one of the things, and particularly with the, uh, with the fire, is I've become obsessed with the, just the changing face of the hill in front of us because it's, you know, the, the relationship to the natural and the unnatural is so highlighted here. In the city, everything is unnatural in a way. Everything is constructed. When you're in the country, you think that you're in the middle of nowhere in, an, in a natural environment. But at the same time, that, that environment is also a construct of human activity and human inputs in a way that until something like fire happens, you, you often just aren't even aware of. that you fit into this uh, environment as someone from the outside? Do you feel that you're accepted within this community? That's actually a really, really good question and it has several answers because there are, there are, there are several communities also. So here there's the, the traditional community of Portuguese people whose parents, grandparents and so, so on back into antiquity have lived here in this area. They often have last names that are the names of the place they live because their families have been there for so long. Um, and they don't speak English? They don't. No, there's no... Because the people that are left here on the whole are elderly and grew up under Salazar's regime, they didn't... Many of them didn't go to school at all. And those that did often learnt French because France, after, the, after Salazar um, fell was the place that many Portuguese went to, to earn money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's, no, there's very, very little English, spe- very few English speakers amongst the traditional people here. That said, they are the world's most welcoming, generous, lovely people. They're very, uh, very welcoming of people coming into the communities. They're constantly being given gifts of delicious food and mm-hmm. 
things, um, wine, cheese, <laughs> whatever, um, that they make themselves. And, you know, they're, they're, I cannot describe how welcoming they are without actually being able to communicate hardly at all. Because you, you speak a little bit of Portuguese now, yeah. but not really anything like super fluent. No, I'm so not super fluent. Mm. And partially that's because we live by ourselves in the forest, so we don't see people on a daily basis. But And Portuguese is quite hard, but mostly I blame growing up in a monolingual mm. environment. Mm. Mm. We just don't... Because we don't get taught second, or at least when I was at school, we didn't get taught second languages in a kind of intensive way that meant that we actually learnt them, mm. except mm. for more than a few words here and there of French or German. Mm. It, we don't have the experience of learning another language properly and I found it really difficult to to learn I'm it's so humiliating personally and this is for a person like you who is very articulate obviously and uh, have lived most of your life through words and language so to come to a place where in fact you're made mute by your uh, uh, you know lack of lack of common language must be very hard it's hard but it's also it's it's very educational <laughs> and and really a really good reminder. I mean, the thing is that particularly if you move through those kind of academic kinds of, of environments, you start valuing particular, you know, things like being eloquent becomes a value. Being able to convince people of something becomes something that you value. Here, because people can't, really convince you of anything with words they they convince you of things by their actions mm. and by their skills and what they do and are mm. and that's actually a really and it, I know it sounds a bit hippy dippy but it's a beautiful thing <laughs> nothing wrong with hippies we quite like a good hippie and what about the other communities you said there's a number of communities so what, who, what, who else is there well, I mean, the, the traditional people are very happy to see people coming in because the area is becoming deserted. And that means that social services and so forth keep going because there's people to use them. And you like, bring money, of course, into the, into, the into the economy. Into the economy. Um, there is one big community of British people mostly. Britain and Portugal have the longest uh, alliance of any two um, countries in the world. And they've been allies since the 11th century. Mm -hmm in an unbroken kind of way. Even though Churchill tried to give Portugal to, <laughs> to Spain. Spain. Yeah. <laughs> there was that, but apart from that. But then they developed the wine industry together, didn't they? They and did. Yeah. Well, it's because the Brits went, oh, this is quite good wine, then we yeah. can't make it. No. But they... Maybe they know something after all these Portuguese yeah. people. Yeah. We'll just whack a bit of, of brandy into it and ship it home. Mm, mm port. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, the, the, all of the big families in the port industry here, or, or many of them, have English names, okay, which right. is kind of... But have been here for centuries. But you must know a, quite a number of expats too, I imagine, too. Well, so there's a British community, but then there's also quite a lot of other um, uh, Europeans from other countries, particularly Holland um, and Germany. Um, and they tend to come here because they have things in mind to do. They want to live... So they're kindred time. spirits. Yeah, they are. Oh, yeah, very yeah. much are. And that's really, I think, where we've found our, our community mm. here is, you know... Fellow techno-peasants. Fellow techno-peasants and, <laughs> and permaculturalists, mm. mostly, who, who are interested in regenerating the land, trying to fight back against the overwhelming dominance of eucalypt and pine and bring back some of the more indigenous kinds of ecosystems that will support... I mean, here, rabbits are indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula. This is where they started. And they're an endangered species here because their environments have been destroyed. Some people in Australia would say that's a good thing. Well, they would, but this is their environment and it needs them. Yeah, that's right. And when they're in the right place. They are in, in the right place, the, everything sits in balance. But the balance has been thrown by by the by these green deserts, mm. and the was it? Do we know if it was Baron von Mueller who bought the the eucalypts to Portugal? Or? Actually, many Portuguese people think they're native. 
<laughs> Many uh, Italians think that eucalypts are native as well. Is that right? Yeah, they're right through the whole of Europe, and they've been yeah. here now for so long that people don't even see them as non-indigenous. Yeah, it is a very bizarre thing to suddenly see a big eucalypt. Mind you, it's different. It, they're not. Well, it's all one species. It's for all, a start. Yeah, it's all one species, and they're, they're spindly and thin, and and nothing like a and the diversity. And yeah, because yeah. they're good for wood like that. Yeah. yeah, they make fence posts and paper pulp, and yeah. firewood. And firewood. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the 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 relationship with with Australia is actually really interesting because when we say we're from Australia, people just look at us as though we're insane. We're like, why are you here when you could be living in Australia? If only they knew. If only. Then I have to point out mm. all the fabulous things about Portugal, and they all get all excited about it. Yeah, do they have a kind of cultural cringe in in Portugal? There's a huge cultural cringe in Portugal. Oh. Isn't that interesting? It's... Maybe that's why Australians like it here. Yeah, <laughs> I think it is. I really think it is. It's yeah. well, I think it's part of it. But I think the thing about Portugal is it has. All of the wonderful things about being in Europe, that is access to centuries of built culture and... And knowledge. And knowledge. And beauty. I mean, the aesthetics. I mean, the, we must keep pointing out how incredibly beautiful um, the local villages, etc., are here. And you look at them and you just think, wow, these people really knew how to make things beautiful in a way that we've never really had in Australia because it's not part of that you know ancient tradition it's the our built community is only 200 years old and i think our built communities are also deeply well australian built communities are, are very administered in a way very legislated so that to find your own little personal expression within that it can be very difficult you know it comes down to what what color you paint your house really in the end or mm. Whatever, you know, you, do, you don't have a lot of choice about what you can do with your home. Whereas here people have been building the same homes for centuries, so they don't have to think about that part of the aesthetics. It's just what, you know, here's some stones, here's some clay, we'll stick them together and here's a room. And what's interesting about that is that even though it's really ancient, it's actually really modern. It feels yeah. super modern. It feels hippie. It feels, you know, mm. permacultural. It feels like what you want to do in the future, not what happened in the past. And and yet, so now we've come to some kind of bizarre this si- cycle. cycle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a real sen- sense of the future meeting the past here. The art world here. I mean, have you um, found artists, Portuguese artists, that you can talk to? The art world here in Busa da Figueira or in central. Um, well, well, this is a very small place. It's only actually you only, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and nobody else live here. So, so that's probably. Central Portugal, yeah. not quite right. No. <laughs> There are there are a lot of um, artists and artisans and craftspeople and so far, and you know there's in fact a, not very far away there's an entire traditional Shisto village given over to the arts mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and which has residencies for international artists and okay. exhibitions and studios and so forth. A group of artists have been running for the last several years. Um, so it's an interest and you know there are arts festivals and plenty of. We have a an art museum in our local little town. You have a fantastic art museum in your local little town, which is incredibly. It's I'll have to describe it to you because it's incredibly modern. It's very sleek, super sleek, it's very beautiful, and set amongst this very ancient village. So quite extraordinary. And how many people would live in the village of Figaro? In the entire district of Figaro, which is actually really quite large, like covers several hundred kilometres, there's less than seven thousand people. <laughs> and yet there's an art gallery that would be... It's like a city gallery. It is like a city gallery. Not yeah. quite as big, but, you know, it's still yeah. some very nice spaces. Oh, it's actually... It's got 
huge numbers of spaces in it that you that the public don't get to see. Oh, that okay. They run workshops and okay. all sorts of things. And so art, art is a big part of, of, um, of Portuguese life. It's not so much art per se. I think in a way creativity Im- kind of imbues through everything that people do. The, like as you were saying, the way that they decorate their houses internally and externally, their gardens. Their, th- there's a, an incredible s- sense of understanding of decoration and beauty, I think. Mm. One of the things I love about Portugal is they have these things called miradouras, which are just points where there's a beautiful view. <laughs> and, you know, there'll, there'll be a little... They'll make a little space so you can stop and admire it, maybe have... A swim or <laughs> and there'll have be a lunch or a, a cafe. clerk to, to Fatima probably and yeah. some kind of yeah fountain possibly but they're yeah. everywhere yeah. you know you'd be some on the top of some mountain where you haven't seen another car for four hours and suddenly there'll be a miradura which you just with an amazing view and a and a barbecue <laughs> <laughs> I love that and and I think. I, I do know, actually know several um, Portuguese artists, more at the kind of experimental art end of Portuguese art, uh, one of whom I believe you're going to be staying with, yeah. Marta Menzies. Um, so bio artists and, and tech artists more than, and street artists. Yeah. But the problem they have is that they are more likely to get reputations internationally than they are inside Portugal. Because it's the cultural cringe, one yeah. more time perhaps. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So Paul Arrigo, the the very famous Portuguese contemporary painter, gifted a house and a collection of her paintings to the Portuguese state, and they can't afford to keep to look after them. Nothing is happening. But you know, internationally, she has a huge reputation, and her yeah. works sell for millions. It's sad, isn't it? Nonetheless, I think you've found yourself in a very gorgeous place and thank you very much for talking to me about it. It's been absolutely delightful. Uh, Thank you for letting me go on and on and (laughs) on. And that was Shirley Saul speaking to me from rural, rural Portugal, from the Slacadonia paradise that she's created. And uh, in a little minute, we'll be talking to some local people who are also interested in creating art-inspired paradises or working in the arts and making environments that are uh, a joy to behold and, in fact, will be able to be beheld as part of the Arts Open weekend coming up in March. But first, Frank, there's a bit of a track you've got for us. Uh, yes, I'm probably only going to play one track tonight yep. and it's going to be Catalyst uh, from the album Manipulating Agent and the song is called Race Against Time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Monday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. with Melissa and Matthew. Hello, darling. Hello, Two hours darling. of music and banter. Each week, different artists and genres. And we are superb. Oh, darling, darling. <laughs> Listen in on Mondays with Melissa and Matthew, 8 to 10 p.m., 94.9 Main FM. Hello, darling. Super. Darling, darling. They are superb. They are. Hello, darling. What a genius idea for a radio show. I Thoroughly recommend it. They come on straight after Arts Wank tonight, so we'll be looking forward to hearing from them. But in the meantime, we're still listening to Arts Wank on Main FM. I'm Suzanne Donisthorpe, and Frank Belts is here too, and he's been playing some beautiful music. Now, also joining us, uh, we have Jen, Jen King and Belinda Prest, who are both artists from the gorgeous Newstead, who collaborate with their partners and will be opening up their own personal Sacadonias, like Shirley was speaking about to the world on the upcoming Arts Open Weekend in March. So welcome both of you to Arts Wank. Thank you. Now, Jen, you, you heard Shirley talking about making this world. Do you relate to that at all? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I guess we sort of, you know, live with the, the spirit of, um, you know, the art of living. So uh, not only just making art for art's sake, but, uh, creating a, a sort of a, a mandala sanctuary that is the mandala that we can inhabit uh, creatively and yes just... well actually we, we came out to visit you today um, and it was wonderful even though it was raining which was even more wonderful I have yes. to say but it's quite a special place perhaps you could describe some of what you've got there to to people get, get a sense of what it's like yeah so we're out at Strangways it's a an old working farm that consists of uh, a number of uh, buildings and structures. Um, the original cottage is from the 1870s. Uh, there's a lovely old barn there as well, a shearing shed and uh, some other spaces we've converted into, into uh, habitable spaces. There's uh, all these amazing nooks and crannies that are just, they're full of character and, and, and Paul's artwork and your artwork everywhere and what looks like a kind of fairly ordinary shed is, is actually transformed by creativity and found objects and pieces of um, you know in incredibly um, elaborate but also simple um, materials that have been used it's it's quite beautiful so people will possibly come to see your place as much for what you've done as for the art that you're making. So, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, we um, we're we're excited to you know open our space up to uh, to people to come and and just wander around and um, and and be inspired. You know, Paul's had this great work ethic and has a really you know good eye for uh, collecting recycled materials from used to be from the tip face before they uh before they became from... a bit mean about that didn't yeah. They? yeah but um the way that, that those elements are incorporated into the space are uh, done very sensitively and very very beautifully very poetically and so um it's i think it's really you know nice and um sort of ethically sound um to to sort of yeah uh, incorporate uh, what potential waste material, which is often so you know, beautiful um, aged timbers and metals. Because mm. there's there's some extraordinary. I mean, I was particularly taken by the shower. There's this <laughs> amazing shower that you have to. Oh, we'll we'll put it on the website when we um uh, when we put this up on air, but. It's it's made you step into it's like walking walking into a kind of um, uh, I don't know Turkey it's almost Turkish in its in its aesthetics it's got a very Oriental feel to it but it's made out of bits and pieces that obviously Paul's found here and there yeah 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 um, and I think yeah yeah Paul does have a very um, well both of us have a have a deep love for the, the sort of um, uh, Moorish, uh, yes, you know, Moorish. Of, uh, that's it. Yeah. Sort of Islamic uh, uh, lines um, and contrasts the way things, uh, materials, and different elements are incorporated to work, you know, together. Um, so you know that the doorways are kind of ballooned arches. Uh, there's a lot of kind of lovely shapes um, scattered throughout. And then yeah. there's an amazing. 
how, what do how, that the, the the fabulous um space that you walk into that is uh the dome the enclosed dome what did you call that yeah uh, the hogan the hogan okay describe that for people so the hogan uh is something that um um paul constructed um uh a few years ago um a safaro cement uh dome um that's kind of got a bit of a, a sort of a steampunk feel about it too hasn't it it's uh yeah steampunk meets meets um yeah islamic it's, art yeah and or sweat lodge pr primitive too. <laughs> kind of yeah uh, or indian even. American, american indian, indian yeah yeah um but that's a really lovely uh sort of dome space um that's again incorporates uh, a lot of found materials so sugar bowls as as windows sort of skylights and um uh yeah all, all sorts of different different things have gone into that but that's a really lovely space to in inhabit yeah we've had a f couple of poetry nights in there recently oh, okay. <laughs> you would have amazing acoustics really great acoustics yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i must say that we were actually recently overseas and we went to um the dali museum yes well actually dali's house and gala dali's got a room that is entirely circular and not unlike yours although there's windows in it but there's um cushioned seats all the way around it but when you walk into it the acoustics are extraordinary yeah. because it echoes and there's a as you stand in the middle you hear this amazing echo so yeah. fabulous conversation yeah. yeah yeah you sit against back against the wall and you and you whisper and it's so the whisper sort of travels around and the everyone outside would hear it. of the room it's really magical wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now I read your um, your CV, or actually your artist statement on your website, which I thought was one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time. Wow! Because um, you start saying that you um, were first fascinated by geology coming from the Grampians, and you've got this um, influence, this profound influence on you has been within rocks, the sense of deep time and geology. So mm. talk to me about that. I guess, yeah, growing up in the Grampians and being very influenced by um, this sort of architectonics of geology, it's just inherent in, in the landscape. Um, so there's this um, amazing structure that, that, or sense of structure or, uh, or mark making, kind of natural mark making that comes from, just from the processes, natural processes of, of geological time, deep time. And so that that was sort of formed a bit of a, a foundation for my um, my passion for for structure and and scale across time and and then you, then you quote all practically every interesting philosopher and mathematician and geophysicist in your journey mm. through mathematics and philosophy and spiritualism. So it's obviously um, a practice that you've thought about in terms of um, the great writers and the great thinkers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I, I I first fell in love with the the suprematists because they they had this kind of wonderful, mystical, condensed sense of consciousness. Um, and then uh, you know, I guess my 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 favourite artist at the moment, you know, my my all time. Uh, uh, hero is uh, John Walsley and I think oh, it's a yes. bit of a step but I reckon he's someone who's really you know his art practice is just embodies mm. um, you know the cosmic but he's right there in the landscape like he's really he's so immersive and yeah he's so passionate and so deep I don't yeah. know if people know him but John Walsley he's actually got a, a part of his practices out up in the Whipstick Forest, which is out north of Bendigo. And did you see the show at the NGV where he's in the dam and he kind of... I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He actually is inside, so far inside the land that he's actually covered in mud. Yes. And he crawls out of the dam and yeah. then... Yes, this dead bird. <laughs> dead bird. <laughs> and the dead bird becomes the, the beginning of a whole work about... that He, he uses the, the, the bird as a brush, a massive... Yes. <laughs> He's a very funny man too. Yeah, he's fantastic. He is uh, fantastic. He's really fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Mathematics and metaphysics. I mean, you're, you're not only interested in art, but you also bring in the sciences and the maths into your practice. What are, what's the connection? Do you think between those two things? Oh, I just wanted the answer to uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Have you found it? Uh, I, 
Well, you know, I, th I think the end point of the kind of mystical aspect of, of that art making process ended up in meditation. And I think that the, the answer was in, was sort of not in the art making at, at that kind of end of, of, of the quest. It, it was really about praxis. So it was really came back to just sort of discovering the, uh, the inner, inner universe. Yeah. So uh, really. Uh, so back to the body. Yeah, I sort of from the mind. Wanted to get out of my mind and 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 into my life really, and that that's where I think the art making process sort of proliferated into the day to day life. So, I want to eat from you know the bowl that I make and with the fork that I make and and, and live and in the, the food space. That you grow. Yeah, and yeah. the space uh, live in the, well, we've got no water <laughs> at the moment, so that's a bit hard. But mm. live in the spaces that we we create and. Um, you know, use use materials from the property to, you know, sort of imbue our home with rich sense of, of, of place. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Belinda. Oh. oh, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you you also uh, live in, actually you're a neighbour of Jens, aren't you? You don't it's live far um, away? Uh, four Ks, approximately to the west from, from Jen and Paul and Trevor and I, Trevor Press, my hu husband, he's a sculptor, and we've lived here in Strangways since the drought of 1982. Are you locals yet? I would think we're getting <laughs> somewhere. Close to it? Yes, and Trevor's been a very active fire brigade, so I think he, he's, you know, got a few ticks in that department. <laughs> but I had our third child born at home, so I think she's local. Yes, 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 yes. So 1982, that's a long time ago. Yes. How, how's, the, how's, the, how's the world changed in, in Strangways in, the, in that period of time in that period of time well the little farm that's to directly to our north that fellow I think his name was Harry used to come and visit us with a carton of quinces mm -hmm. and the carton was always um, I think carton draft and he would never take <laughs> he would never give them to me he had to give them to Trevor because he was old school and he must man have been to suspicious man. of me okay and you don't look that suspicious no. to me. <laughs> and how else has it changed? Oh, the dams are empty yeah. <laughs> again. The trees have grown, but they're looking very stressed. Hmm. And does the place that you live in, the, in this environment, this, I think I've heard a, a statistic that Castlemaine and, and the environs has more artists per square kilometre than anywhere else on earth. I mean... <laughs> <do> <laughs> Uh, and I have felt that there has been a, there's a lot of people who are doing amazing things around here. Do you feel that you're a part of, of a big community around here, both of you? I have a fairly strong connection with Castle Maine and I ha am still very involved in um, a studio of yoga and creative dance. I have a very strong part of that's a pretty predominant part of my arts practice. Yeah. Streaming out from that, other people who work for um, Edna who runs that business, often they are artists as well. So I've got that connection. And for probably 20 years, Trevor went every Tuesday night and went life drawing. And so he's made some very um, strong connections with mm. the likes of Liz Caffin and other um, drawers. And I quite enjoy the, the uh, Newstead group, whereas Trevor's just too busy to be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll, he'll go into the fire brigade at Newstead, but because he wants to stay in his shed and and work, and tell while us about because Trevor, Trevor's not Trevor's. Um, I, I read I read his CV too, which I thought was wonderful, and and includes. Um, he tells us that he was ex, he went to um, Croydon College of the Arts in South Wales when as a young man in England. I take it. Yes. And he was there, but then he was expelled, which is also... Oh, that's a great story. Yeah, the, no. what, what tells us about that? Oh, well, that story is that uh, there was a janitor at that tech where yeah. that was an art school and he took a disliking to the art students and there was some keys planted on, on, in Trevor's locker and so Trevor was looked very suspicious about these, why would these keys be there? And so he was given marching orders. And then um, and then the family migrated as 10 pound poms. I think they were to Broad Meadows. Yeah. And then um, I met Trevor at the National Gallery Arts School. And I was a, a raw girl out of school in Canberra. And he'd, he'd been around a bit. He was, he was a good seven years older. And, um, and lo and behold, one of our art teachers there, Mark Clark, 
had taught at Croydon. Oh, really? And so Trevor... Did you remember Trevor? Not. We... Trevor did... At one stage, Mark said, you know, you remind me of somebody. Oh, no, no, it's not me. It's not me, says Trevor. But then we went to Mark's 80th birthday party some decades later. later, And (laughs) Trevor owned up to the fact that, yes, he was that fellow that had been expelled. (laughs) (laughs) But when he did his interview with uh, Linton Parr, who happens to be one of my favourite sculptors, Linton said... Have you been to art school before, Trevor? Oh, no, 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 I haven't, I haven't. No, 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 just self-taught, self-taught. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't want his past to, no, he to influence to the future. Start off again. But yeah. then he went to the VCA, didn't he? When, he did, yes. yes. And that, that's where you met him, is that we right? We did, yes. We happened to get into a sort of the first little subgroup we got put in together with a very fine um, teacher called Elwyn Dennis, who uh-huh. is a sculptor, and he lives in the Grampians, and we were very pleased that he actually brought a one of Trevor's sculptures last year. Oh. So it was a first for <laughs> Trevor. And did you, were you doing sculpting or you were yeah, doing... Yeah, I did sculpture as well and I yeah. did, um, so we used to hang around together in the um, in the sculpture studio. So, but now you are not so much a sculptor as a drawer, is that right? And a creative yeah. dancer? I, yeah, I, I was the working partner of our little operation and... I taught for many, many years, some six years at Taradale Primary School ah. and then over at Carisbrook Primary School for 20 odd Listeners, years. we come from Taradale, which is why <laughs> I think Belinda's saying that about you know, Taradale Primary School, which is, I'm here to tell you, very it's a marvellous again. thing has happened and a whole lot of kids have re-enrolled. I think there's 11 preps this year, which that's, is that's wonderful because there great. was a, a bit of a, um, a downturn in student numbers for a while there, shall we say. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, some, uh, while I was at Taradale, I became very good friends with Tim Henderson, who ah, was a team, very yes. big wonderful uh, team. Taradale character and he he came across to our studio on quite a few occasions to participate in uh, our we would put on I would facilitate a um, performance and um, we used to call ourselves the Ministry of Delight and we would um, put on a performance and then the next day we would open up for the Castlemaine State Festival as a sculpture as a as a performance uh, as a um, art gallery yeah so it was a jolly lot of hard work and we've actually decided it was too exhausting so we're not going to do it again but team henderson and many other people from the district um Mm. came in and people we used to get 90 people come along into the shed with no insurance and we had blackouts and we was just great fun (laughs) now now you you tell us that trevor doesn't really want us you know he's he had to be talked into this arts open a bit because he likes to work yes so what does he do? To give us a sense of a, um, a day in, in, the, in his life. What, what, what's his kind of routine like? What's his routine? Well, after his breakfast of millet porridge, which we call <laughs> cement that he grinds, <laughs> and possibly a poached egg from the, from the chooks and leftover veggies, he'll, we take the two staffies for what we call a bound in our paddocks, he go, and then he ends up in the shed and he'll work solidly through until probably 12.30, mm-hmm. come down from possibly three quarters of an hour, go back up again and um, he'll work continually until um, I cooey to say that I've... It's time um, for gin and tonics. No, (laughs) it's not gin and tonics time. uh, We have our uh, middle child, Tegwin, who was born... Oh, she wasn't born at our place, but she has a learning disability and she lives with us and she's also a painter when she's energetic. And so I cooey her to say that dinner's up and he'll come down and um, and there you go. And then then he and his art practice is quite different from um, Paul and Jen's in the fact that he he doesn't use find, found objects. He no, he, he makes he, everything himself. Yeah, it's an yeah, engineering yeah, yeah. workshop, and yes. so uh, that tends to be the biggest eye open eye opener, jaw dropper for when visitors come in because it looks quite. Um, it's got a big character of all It has. His work is absolutely fabulous and people should check it out. Um, we're going to have to wind up now because unfortunately the hour is almost up. I can't believe it. But look, thank you so much for coming in and I do encourage everybody to go along to the Arts Open weekend in March and you'll see the work of the people like Jen and Belinda and Trevor and Paul. Paul. Um, and Tegwin. And, and Tegwin, okay. And and it's a marvellous thing to do and I think there's 90 artists involved this year which is extraordinary and a really wonderful thing and we're hoping to get as many people as we can onto the Arts Swank program in the next coming weeks to talk about 
what's available for people to see on that weekend. So thanks very much, everybody, for listening, and we'll be back again next week. So goodbye and have a good week. It's grand. It's grand. Whoa, 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 whoa.